Hello everybody. We're back again on the SETI. Oh my gosh, this is the last um, in this current series, Carbon Narrative series. I am just so, um, I feel moved every single time that we start the series um, and end it. Um, so yeah, thank you for everyone who's joining us today um, via YouTube um, or via uh, Zoom with us here. Um, so I just wanted to kind of, as usual, right, start with um, my intro and just kind of welcome everyone into the space. Um, yeah, and I hope you're all looking forward to this talk today because I am every single week. Um, so for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, welcome, hello. Um, I'd like to give you some insight into what On The SETI is. In the front room, the SETI offers a place of sanctuary, a place where you can take a load off. Um, and On Our SETI, you'll discover conversations that will slot into your day, like a catch up with an old friend or your favorite song, or something that makes you feel at home yet vulnerable and connected with others. And um, this series is surrounding um, storytelling. So storytelling is a powerful means of fostering connections among people, between ideas um, and experiences. When it comes to our countries, our communities and our families, we understand intuitively that stories and we hold in common are in, an important part that kind of ties and binds us together as well as the importance of space for many viewpoints, ideas. Um, and in this series, we will be connecting with people who use the art of narrative throughout their work to connect, educate, and share the experience of others and themselves. And um, so we're steering away from kind of monolithic narratives by sharing celebration, pain, love, and kind of everything that comes in between. Um, document documentation plays an important role in this process. And this series of conversations moves between still image, moving image, and the written word to consider different ways that stories can be archived um, and shared, as well as who feels that they're able to do this. So I am your host, Danny Evans Ingram, um, also known as Zaz or Zazu. And today I'll be speaking um, to a storyteller, writer, black and green ambassador, mm -hmm. Zakia McKenzie. Um, so just to let you know, the Q&A is open for the talk. And um, whether you are watching the stream via YouTube, please use the comment section um, to ask questions. They will kind of zoom all the way over to me. Um, and if you are here in the Zoom call, please feel free to use the Q&A um, function. So firstly, Zakia, if you could just give us a wave um, and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Hi, greetings. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much to you, Zaza and Civic Square. First of all, big up to you guys. Just thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Zakia, and I think I'm so happy to be on a series about storytelling because lately I think I'm, I'm so much more a storyteller than a writer. I like to consider myself a storyteller. So I suppose, you know, that's the first thing I like finding stories and being able to translate them um, a lot. And so I do that throughout kind of a lot of things that I do. So I'm also a PhD student and I'm looking at stories again, looking at Black British um, people in journalism in the UK, kind of like post -windersh. And I'm also like a little nature girl, you know, my family call me the earth mama. I'm also a mother. And so I suppose it fits at this time. Um, and writing, kind of writing about my my um, experience of the English countryside and also like the city and the green spots and stuff around here. And always connecting that back to growing up in Jamaica. Yeah, Amazing. that's me. So when you say around here, can we um, find out what city you are currently Ooh. in? Yeah, I'm in Bristol, and so I was I was born in London, grew up in Jamaica, and I, I came back to the UK maybe about six years ago now, and I've been in Bristol since then. I, I probably would have stayed in London, but I actually came to visit my auntie in Bristol, and I was like, I'm staying here instead yeah. of London. So yeah, I chose Bristol. I, I chose to be here instead of London. So yeah, that's where I am, and that's where I, that's where I still am to this day. Thank you for that. 
Um, so I really wanted to kind of get started with um, a little bit about your personal kind of connections with nature um, and the environment. And you've kind of touched a little bit on it um, in your intro. So how have you kind of, how did you get into and stay in touch with nature um, personally, professionally, as a writer, as a PhD student? Um, how have you kind of kept those links um, on those types of levels? And I am going to pull up one of your poems in a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. so talk about that. Um, if we just start there, that would be great. Yeah. You know, I think the easiest answer for that is that, uh, you know, growing up in Jamaica, it's, it's, I think that it's very different that we do a lot of things outdoors or we do a lot of things with the environment, right? I mean, you know, pretty easy one is that, you know, by the time you're like my son's age, by the time you're like eight, seven, eight, you can go outside and you can pick like your morning tea, right? You can pick some mint or some lime leaf and it's not really a big thing. We don't really like consider it, oh, I'm connecting with nature. It's just kind of using what you have around you. So I think having grown up like that, just having these connections just because of where I was and what was around us. When I moved back to England, I think I recognized that, um, you know, like my son wasn't gonna get that here. Mm. You know, the, the children that we come across don't really get that. And so I, I suppose I made an effort to kind of seek it out here to keep that element or that thing that I knew I grew up with to kind of keep it in my life so he could experience it. And, and also me, you know, it's not, we're never too old for it. So, so that was how I was able to keep connected with it. And it just so happens that in work, like I, uh, my, my work, you know, volunteering and kind of paid work, I was always working at, um, like since since coming to the UK, working with community organizations who had these things in mind or wanted to. So I was kind of always able to be like, oh, I'm interested, like, you know, and and get involved in a, in a way. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to pull up one of your poems now. It will be amazing if you could read this poem. Um, OK. I went through a lot of your work obviously, because I was really excited about this talk, and I'm really excited about um, the, the things that you do. Um, so if I can pull up the right screen, let's see if it wants to do that. No, bear with me one moment. Let me just see why Zoom doesn't want to play ball today. No problem. Um, I, as I was going kind of through your, through your poems particularly, um, there was really something that was cropping up for me that was, it was almost talking about, or, or sharing these connections with with place with nature but in a very um in a very specific way you were interlocking kind of like emotion and the way that nature kind of interacts with who we are on a day-to-day -day, how we kind mm -hmm. of decide to share ourselves um and that's kind of what I wanted to speak about um from this poem and um, when it rains in the forest um and if Zoom wants to allow me to share the right thing. It would be great. Uh, let's have a look if it's going to come up. I can probably just read it for you as well. Yeah, that yeah, that would be amazing because it's yeah. All right, I have it here. Okay, okay. And this was um a part of uh, my collect collection for Forestry England. And again, this was kind of just the uh, you know the first times of me being in the countryside really or the, the woods the like the forest in England um after just not having that experience and <clears throat> not having anything to compare it to and of course like the the, the okay I've got it here it is I'll read it for you I'll read it for you and then we can talk yeah it's when it's rain when it rains in the forest rain is not sadness it's falling does not send me to sorrow instead I welcome the washing away wrought by the fresh forest shower. Its thrashing is a mother's womb. It is heartbeat and pitter patter. In this safe place, cocooned, to be wet makes it no lesser. Simple. That's it. I like how you just ended that with simple. There's, there's like <laughs> simple in form, but not simple in, um, in the, the emotion that it brings up. There's this particular line for me. Um, and it's, it's falling does not send me to sorrow. And then the next yeah. one, 
it's thrashing, it's a mother's womb, it's heartbeat and pitter patter. There's something about when we when we speak about nature, especially when we do that creatively, right? Because there's so much about nature that is a very kind of like scientific and it's about growth and it's about kind of planting the right seeds at the right time. It's about kind of what the soil is saying um, and what that that means, if it's too acidic or not acidic enough. Mm -hmm. um, but I think with this poem, White really kind of stood out to me is this idea of nature reflecting who we are, right? And and us reflecting who nature is as well. Because I think sometimes there's a, a, a part of what we do that can kind of disconnect us with that. And we just see nature as just an environment and yeah. not really interconnected with yeah that. and I can't I guess one of my questions around this poem is when you wrote it was there something that was there this connection with nature that like poured out of you or was there something about mm. trying to show that connection so was it interconnected or was it something that was kind of deliberate for us to to see these connections yeah no I think I did do it very deliberately mm. right um one of the things about coming into the British countryside or the British not just the countryside actually like the nature writing scene or mm. the environmental movement you know that that space which as you know as everything is it's already a defined space you already have your in crowd you already have your out crowd you already have a way to do it that's recognized you already have a way that's not recognized that will just look totally different and i think what was what was kind of always funny for me is that you know like the things that there's a lot about it that i just didn't like and i had to challenge myself to be like dog it, it rains in england all the time why am i going outdoors why why do i want to be in the woods, it rains all the time. Do I want to get rained on, you know? <laughs> so there was a way where I had to challenge myself to do those things and take things that are like disparate and, and almost like upsetting because I, I, I was getting rained on when I thought about this and it was upsetting. But at the same time, I think about like, there was movement, right? When it rains, there's this movement, there's this thrashing, right? There's like splashes and things are, there's wind and so there's movement. So I was like, what else is like that? And I mean, in a very uh, literal way, labor is like that. It's like waves. It feels like waves when, you know, there's there's um, contractions and stuff. It's, it's almost like you, there's waves, there's that thrashing as well. So I thought, okay, that's to me, there was a connection there. And while labor might be hard and rough, for me at the end, there was a, a happy, there was a happy thing. So I could be like, okay, okay, these are two things that are rough and like, uh, I don't, don't want to do them, but through doing them, there's something gained. Even if it was just like being able to write a poem that about the rain of be, you know, having been in the rain that time, you know? <laughs> something that I've really, I've really been trying to live by, and I'd say the past, maybe like seven months or something like that. And the saying is about, um, there never being bad weather, just like the wrong clothing choices. And the only reason I've been like trying to live by this is because like you said, right? England, it rains a lot, it's cold. You know, there's there's just these things that make you um, maybe not want to interact with your environment because of these natural things that happen, right? It's raining, okay. Yeah. I don't really want to go out. Um, it's cold. I don't really want to go out. But for me, I've really had to, in order to reconnect myself with with nature, with the environment, and and that connection hasn't just come from me just thinking like, okay, I need to leave my house. But obviously, lockdown has obviously impacted that even more because I it the the need to be outside yeah. has kind of been so necessary for a yeah. lot of people that this saying I've had to just keep it in my brain because you know what it means okay I'm looking outside there's some rain clouds I'm gonna have to put on my waterproof jacket because I want to go for that mm -hmm. walk I want to be surrounded by the trees I mm -hmm. want to see the the new growth and and feel like that same kind of connection and almost 
fierce like love that I have for myself I want to see that in nature because mm-hmm. it is so reflective um and it's just been really interesting like I'm a, a real like plant person my flat is like full of plants um and I think there's something really deliberate about that like that this kind of same deliberate um process that you went through in trying to yeah. to show this with a poem I think there's something uh-huh. deliberate about saying this is my environment and this is how I'm going to show it mm-hmm. and what I kind of um want to 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 be connected to and yeah there's something really interesting about that I'm gonna try and see no 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 I think it was you know I just want to say it like you, you make an absolutely good point because you have to have the gear right if you don't have the gear you're not going to go out in the rain and then that oh. becomes a problem that becomes a problem if you can't afford the gear and all of this so that's why there's a specific way that it looks and I think I've always especially through you know like some of the work I'm sure we'll talk about um you know it's definitely about turning that on its head and saying look like we can have multiple there are many stories and and I don't believe that people aren't telling their stories they're possibly just not being listened to you know and I think there is that it's really I'm glad you said that and um it's really important about I think it can be easier for people to say well people aren't speaking about this thing or Da, 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 da. but often it's just that people aren't necessarily listening mm-hmm. in the way that like we kind of should be um and it's really important and I know as we kind of go on this conversation um we will be kind of touching on some of that as well um mm-hmm. so my next bit of um your writing that I really um <clears throat> would like just ah uh, I I read this and I was just I felt so so connected um in a very particular way so I'm gonna just um put that on the screen now and if you would do the honors of um, yeah. reading this and then we'll kind of go into it and talk a little bit more that'd be great Akira. all right and it's from Sefe, Nan Shepherd and the Cairngorm Mountains in the living mountain Shepherd introduces the reader to the Scottish term fey meaning to be a little mad fayness It reminds me of another time when that same sound might be uttered by a different people, albeit, to identify when one is above his or herself, overconfident, a little mad. Sefe is a Jamaican patwa term that signals a deer. It can be used as a call to draw swords and battle may follow. As Shepard points out the picture of pitting oneself against the mountain, which every single person who hikes the King Cairngorms must do, it is as if she is saying, Fe, on guard to the mountain, ready for what it throws. Thank you. Um, so for me, there's like a couple of things that like I just want to kind of talk about. Um, so this throughout your your work and this is the the connection that I was speaking about there's almost this way that you are connecting different people different stories different experiences but showing the similarities Mm -hmm. uh, and showing kind of who who we are in lots of different ways um Mm -hmm. so even with this there's this kind of connection of these two terms from two different places Mm -hmm. that are still saying the same thing right that Mm -hmm. are still saying like you know these these ideas around being a little bit a little bit mad a little bit confident a little bit all things and like almost these these battle calls as well um and I love how the connection of space and place allows you to to do that so yeah with this like because this is just an extract um we will post uh, the the link to the the full readings so people can have a look um which is, is a book review so there's something i guess that calls out to me and it's when you're writing and when you are writing about kind of space that is outdoor Mm -hmm. and as you mentioned earlier your connections kind of in Jamaica and being able to like at the the age of probably eight right going outside and like picking your own tea or or, like going out and like when you kind of were were doing this this book review were there moments that you were 
realizing some of these connections for yourself in that moment or was this or is this something that you feel quite innately having I know that you're someone who's lived in different parts of the world so is there this innate feeling through environment through mm -hmm. nature through your writing yeah. is there something that is just really yeah. interesting yeah. I think absolutely and you know maybe I never even thought about that before that I have lived in quite a few places and so maybe like nature and writing about it it's one of the things that helps me ground myself in a new place or in a space that I have um, never explored before and outdoor spaces as well because mm -hmm. you know while there are a lot of things that are different we're going to have just some similarities, right? They're gonna be trees. You might find different trees, but they're gonna be trees. You might even find the same trees and then find out that the trees in like Bedgebury in Kent, a lot of them are from South Africa, right? Yeah. You'll find out why. And then I'm like, oh, I know those trees. I know like eucalyptus. I know this tree from Jamaica. And so for me, possibly that's been a way for me to connect space and place for myself in terms of trying to uh, settle, maybe. I don't know, Yeah, you know? I, I kind of never thought about it in that sense before, but I definitely, when I think about it, have done that quite a lot in is linking up um, the environments of different geographies, but link, but you know, writing about them in 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 a in 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 the same way. And I mean, like I've never been to Scotland. I've never been to Scotland, and the Cairngorms is in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And I just read this book, and I, that that term stood out to me because I thought, like we said, we have a thing in Jamaica where it says "sefe." Like sefe, sefe if you're bad, right? Sefe. And so I just thought, it can't, you know, and then I'm just like, oh my goodness, I wonder if this is where, you know, if these words are linked. And so I'm just always trying to find out like if, if it's a connection there or something. And I mean, you're right, possibly because it's 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 me trying to um, figure out my own emotions of a space, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I've never been to Scotland and, uh, you know there was a way for me to connect through it through just this one word and I was like okay I get this now right now, but yeah it's like re-seeing yeah. yourself right in in this yeah world. not re-seeing but seeing yourself in this particular way as well yeah um, it's really beautiful and I think and I really got that sense I felt kind of like and for me whose family are um from the Caribbean who are Jamaican there's this there was this natural kind of for me like oh my gosh and you know it's like I haven't necessarily heard that phrase but I knew exactly when I read it, mm -hmm. I read it in comparison I knew exactly what it meant right and, and yeah, I got a it. feeling yeah when you go on um into it in um the that that book review to kind of use examples right of when it will be used kind of like kids chasing each other or like playing and kind of like having this moment of daring each other almost yeah. almost and there's something about like like nature like even like the wind blowing there's almost this daring thing always kind of happening um and it's like a day like today in Birmingham it's so windy and yeah. I like look outside because I've got a really nice view of um some like really beautiful trees and there's almost this like real daringness about it and like even when we speak about like thunder there's mm -hmm. a daring there's like a mm -hmm. and I just just even through this like really small kind of like um exa I just was like oh that's it that's this daring nature right um on the back of that I just wanted to um ask kind of because you have lived in um, different areas so you mentioned um to me when we spoke before um that you've lived in Jamaica South Africa and obviously I live in England now do you think there's a do you think there's like a, a a shared experience of of those those places? Um, is there something you know, like what are the similarities and like what are the differences that you've felt and yeah. kind of yeah? And does is that something that you actively kind of was there experienced? It was just like oh wow, these things are kind of interconnected. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Absolutely, you know, I couldn't ignore it. I mean, especially when coming to England and and just knowing that this is the place where the wealth was had and where everything else was extracted too. Yeah. And and like I said, I mentioned um, while I was at the forest during my writer's residency um, at the forest in Kent in Bedgebury, and just recognizing a lot of trees and being like, yo, and asking the dendrologist 
so she's like a, a tree expert these mm -hmm. people are like know everything about trees and and really like they're they're really good at, at this place what he because he explained to me like yeah lots of these trees we got them here um during uh the like the expeditions and the hunt like there's persian tea you know why there shouldn't be persian tea growing in the uk right i was there i was picking a couple of leaves and saying look this is persian tea leaves like i sh shouldn't have those things here and so there's a way where i couldn't ignore it because like i've been to the places where where they have to deal with the backlash of that 200 300 years later you know still dealing with it so i think there's a way where connecting those um and, and i suppose i was always doing it but probably with a less critical and, and i mean um and i don't mean critical as you know always thinking everything is bad but i just mean like not always like seeing there was a there was a time when i would have seen a tree from south africa here and i've been happy and felt comforted but no it makes me feel a little bit cringe because i understand or i, I can understand that there's a, a history behind it and and what it would have meant to have those things here now um, and, and I mean, like Forestry England are doing good work because they tell me straight up, like the, the trees that are here, we're doing a lot of work um, to protect them because we know what we've done to them, mm. you know? And so I think I have to write those stories to say like, look, the reason why the like national tree of the Bahamas and the national flower of Jamaica right now is on the endangered, uh, you know, potentially endangered plants, is because it was the number one thing sh shipped out of Jamaica during sl the slavery days, right? It was the wood that was used to make the slave ships. It was like the most popular wood because it was so dense and so hard. So they, it was used, right? And and, it, and it, there's no more. We don't have that much. I mean, there is. It still grows, but it is it is potentially endangered, and we can't forget those histories because you know, like it, it can't go so. Like we have to remember what happened, you know. Absolutely, and there's always a conversation around colonialism when we are speaking about resource, when we're speaking about natural resource. Yeah. Um, and I think that conversation is really important to be had because it is offering so many, um, it's offering so many answers to questions that people don't often want to ask. Um, mm. And I think when it comes to looking at colonial history, we have to look at that because it's a part of our history and it is something that, you know, has ramifications right now, right? There are, like you said, there are literally like plants that are going on to endangered lists because they were seen as, as a commodity in a lot of ways. Oh, we're gonna take this thing and, and look at this. This is, we discovered this. And I think when we're in, in those conversations, I think it's really difficult because we speak a lot about um, resource, right? We speak a lot about um, how mining is happening all over the world, how, and we'll go into this a little bit later on actually when we're speaking kind of about global south. But I think when we, when we do that, we really have to remember that this is not something that is you know, like colonial histories are not just something that are in the past, like we are literally here now living in a really yep. extractive way. Yep. And I think there's, it's, it's important, it's part of that conversation. I think yep. the climate conversation is, is so huge, um, but there is these elements of actually, you know, the, the, the global south, <laughs> the, the, mm. the places where we are um, seeing that extraction really, at the forefront right and seeing what that that means when this extraction happens yeah. um, I think we can actually go on to that that now um so for me in my own mind um I always split I kind of have to split things up into certain very broad categories okay. um, for me to be able to like weave the nuance kind of throughout them um so when I think of, of the planet, when I think about the conversations we're having about climate change um, and just also our really local kind of, um, our local needs and wants for our communities, mm -hmm. I kind of think of one section, which is like ancestry. Um, and that is a little bit about, you know, something that connects us through generations. I would say and then the next is like the local conversation about our environment and then the the global 
and these all kind of connect in some ways and they are very broad so it'd be good for you to maybe kind of start with that and we can kind of start weaving some of them um mm -hmm. them together so if we start with kind of ancestry and i know ancestry also connects with the work and um, black and green are doing and we'll kind of go into that as well so we can tie it all together yeah yeah um so again you know uh and a lot of it is just um having had these experiences growing up in jamaica mm -hmm. where uh when i came here was the same thing. I wasn't the only one. There were a lot of people who either had experiences in other places or their families did. And either, they, you know, they knew them or wanted to connect with them or wanted to share them. And so, especially through the Black and Green Project, which is through uh, Ujima Radio in Bristol, where I was kind of like originally uh, a volunteer. That's the first place in, in, in the UK that actually gave me a chance. Right. And and through that project, we, you know, we recognize that the people who we were representing and dealing with in Bristol had a lot to share mm -hmm. um, from, you know, really traditional kind of collective knowledge bases of, of old stuff. Right. And so we, we knew that it was one of the things we wanted to, to do. And I, it's how I am, I suppose, in my own kind of work, too, because, like I said, there are these stories and I just, you know, I, when I came back to England, I just recognized like, hold up, England is so backward in how it does not want to recognize the things that people have done, like people of color have done for, for centuries. But definitely since post-war, when we had these masses of people from the, what's now the Commonwealth, so from the Caribbean, from, from parts of Africa, from parts of, of Asia, South Asia and stuff, since then there's been a lot of stuff that has happened in this country that whether or not it's been documented and recorded like all right now is the time we're not about to let anybody forget right we, we, we're going to gather all of that no I, th I think you guys are do absolutely great working towards that regard as well but and and you know the past year we've seen everybody decide that they need to do that which is good but i don't hold my breath for a lot of a lot of these organized like i don't hold my breath for a lot of these big institutions including the ones that like i'm involved with at university you know i, I attend a university but at the same time we know that those are institutional problems mm -hmm. so when it comes to like wanting to do what we want to do which is the community um talk you know getting stories about people's like like real traditional knowledge, home knowledge, um, and just stories. And also for people to have a chance to feel involved, we definitely work and say, like, we're here to represent what, what you know. You know, we're here to gather those stories because we really and truly believe that the conversation is missing a lot of that. And if we're talking about climate justice, environmental justice, mm -hmm. and climate change, my thing is that like climate change is one world, you know, it's one globe. Like it has to be all of us. We cannot just protect our little part because they're gonna be knock on effects. So the more you get people involved by giving them the information and also letting them know that their information is valuable. And guess what? You're an expert on your own situation. Then the more people you have involved to find the solutions, right? Then we move into the point where we're creating the solutions that make life better for more of us and and so we're not we're not gonna forget we're, we're not gonna forget those stories we're not gonna forget the ancestral stories and the traditional um knowledge because and especially why we have to like consciously affirm it because we are living very western city lives like let's not let's not like joke you know we, we definitely know that we're living these lives here um in the UK that a lot of our family members just don't have, right? So there's a way where I think we, we or me personally and, and, the, and the Black and Green Project at least have a way to represent that and keep it as a part of the knowledge in a nature movement or a climate change conversation, you know? Because also they, they repackage a lot of stuff and I said they as in the, the, the movement, you know, big, big environment, um, will repackage a lot of stuff that we've been doing for years. We we'll repackage it as if it's a new sustainable development thing. Like, no, you know, knowledge has, it's been there. We've been ignored. Yeah. Absolutely. And, I, and on this kind of ancestry strand, just to think about, um, and I, I feel like I, I've I felt this more within the pandemic 
um, or it kind of came out of me more in the pandemic. But it's like this idea of like really linking back to what you have grown up hearing around like, you know, uh, remedies or how nature can aid your health and things like that. So for me, like even thinking back to certain things that like my like nan would say about like things that are like good for your immune system and it's like, you know, or like drinking garlic tea or like having surrogacy, like there's all of these parts of, of like our histories that are so embedded into, into us that it really does like kind of make you connect with the environment in a different way. And it might not be your local environment, right? Because it doesn't, I can't necessarily go outside and find like sea moss, I don't know, I can't, or, or something like that. I can't just walk out, right, and do that thing. But there's something about those intergenerational stories that are just so like tied into who you are. And it's in these like moments of like, of wanting to and needing to feel safe, feel that you can take parts of your health into your own hands, if that's like something that you can do in a, in a way that is, is healthy and beneficial for you. Um, and for me, all of those stories have come from my elders. That's not something that I necessarily have like learned now in adulthood. No, it's things that have like, it's the seeds that have been sown from like being a child. And there's something about that that is so important that actually, you know, we, we, we talk about that within the, the environmental kind of conversations, but it's often through um, practices that are not held in the forefront, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. environmental activists who are saying that, like, this is what I, I, I do in, in my culture. This is like an indigenous practice. And it's always more yeah. yeah. in these ways, right? And it's not necessarily at the forefront of the conversation yep. um, and I do think in a lot of ways it's because some of these things aren't necessarily like sexy they're not something that can be repackaged and sold mm -hmm. on and yeah. it's not something that capitalism can can get a grip on right because it's not about that and it's never been about yeah. that it's about resource it's about identity and there's something really important about that I think that when something can't be repackaged, who are the people that are, are holding those really important conversations and stories on the pedestal that they deserve to be on, right? Like where are we finding these conversations? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the work that, that you're doing kind of at Black and Green and, and the other ambassadors are doing is, is something about that because it's this, these local conversations, it's these yeah. local um, stories where people are able to share like who they are and what they know. And yeah. um, it would be really nice to hear about um, some of the ambassadors at yeah. Black and Green who are doing like specific work around kind of ancestral yeah. connections. Um, yeah, it'd be really great to hear about that. Yeah, so I'm actually one of the old ambassadors too, so I should make that clear. Jasmine, Ketibua, Foley and I, were the two like alumni of the program so far. And so we have three new ambassadors this year and Asia is working on a project, which is, you know, very much about ancestral culture connections and kind of gathering stories from the Somali community about how they engage with nature and, and sustainability really so we're looking forward to that because you know in Bristol now the largest black population is the Somali population mm -hmm. and you know Jazz and I just don't speak the language and don't have that in that Asia will have and so even within our own group we recognize that there's still you know work to be done in getting um other people into the conversation as well. And so we're looking, you know, Asia's project is going to definitely put some of uh, those, that, that information, that those, 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 you know, ancestral co collective memories mm. that probably a lot of the community in Bristol have from home, from back home, you know, or the ones that have created some, some here, we'll get those from Asia's project. And our other two ambassadors now, Roy and Olivia, um, Olivia is working on 
air pollution, which again is going to be really interesting because that's a, a huge problem here in Bristol, right? And not only in Bristol, but with, with thinking, you know, we're thinking across the, the UK and we're thinking globally as well. And if we if we have, you know, Ella Kissy Deborah here in, in the UK having it on her death certificate that air pollution is what killed her, then we, I mean, you know, we, we think it's a big enough problem in Bristol and it already is a huge problem, especially because of the disparity, right? Especially because of the disparity in the city in having nine years uh, or, or 10 years um, life expectancy on eight, year, on eight minutes on the train from say uh, Barton Hill to Clifton. And within those eight minutes, you have 10 years of life expectancy and air pollution is the cause of uh, the big cause in one of these areas, right? So Asia's project, I mean, Olivia's project is gonna be looking at that air pollution for us. And I mean, there's so many conversations around that too because you have a lot of middle-class people burning wood fires every evening in the winter and that's just that's problems too so we can't all say the city council and the, the motto is right um and roy is looking at parks right inner city he's 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 always kind of work with kids in inner city children in inner cities and so he's definitely thinking about how how we how we connect on a yeah on, a, on our doorstep right because the other thing is as much as we like to go out and go far at black and green we definitely see that as a problem of the environmental and climate movement that we are kind of agitating you know we, we stand on the outside to say look at what you're missing and and continue doing our work you know um but roy is definitely about all right there's a lot of um uh, young people in 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 the cities and we don't necessarily get them using the parks yeah. um you know you'll get them on the streets but we don't get them in the parks with any kind of uh, positive use that we can see and so his project is um, looking at uh, not just young people as well but adults and how is it that people in inner city in Br inner city Bristol can do that because we recognize when it was our turn to do when when Jazz and I were doing the project right whenever it was anything um, that we were doing where we were taking people out they would come if it was like oh we're going outside of bristol they would come because they hadn't had a chance to do that or not regularly you know so and we would have these organized trips that they would be on um so we know that they want it so we can't always and and we can't always have these organized things for people to be involved in can we create a situation where they'll do it on their own if it is that we, we understand how we can better use the parks right for sure and if the there's something about cities and the way that you can experience one city in so many different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. So we have this in Birmingham and um, I'm sure you probably feel this disconnect in, in Bristol too, is that, you know, Birmingham, like, you know, it's, it's quite, it's, it's a big city, but you can go to the north of Birmingham and it'd be very different to like the south of Birmingham, right? And that really, it's really interesting because if you look at kind of like, you know, if you go to somewhere that's really tall, I don't know, maybe like um, Perrot's Folly, for instance, which is kind of in um, Edge of Aston and Birmingham. If you go to the top of there and it's kind of, and it's a near kind of, it's edging onto inner city kind of areas. And you look at, at the, the city, the part you can see from there, it's very, very green very green then let's say you go to the north of the city there's something about these really really small space green spaces um but then a lot of it is very like concrete and it's buildings and it's da 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 da, -da. Mm -hmm. and i think that kind of the different views that you can have of one city is mm -hmm. really really um it's telling right because if you're in in a city area you will see parks that are that are there and are used in in a very different way to let's say um parks in like the south of the city where people are like i'm going on a walk i'm gonna have mm -hmm. a picnic i'm gonna have this and there is definitely something around the conversations um that people have about the outside space i think sometimes within like more inner city areas there's a 
because there's not loads of like green space right it's like okay I'm gonna get out of my house right yeah. that's why you do see lots of young people kind of more like on the street let's say yes um because there's this idea of okay well this is this is the thing right this is the, the next place to go yeah. and I think parks aren't necessarily promoted as places for young people to go and explore right and I think that's really really important to note in this conversation because it's not just about green spaces not being accessible it's that they're not accessible in certain types of Mm -hmm. ways it's it's how we're kind of presenting and 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 promoting who has you know it's really about who has um who has it's all about us thinking who has the right to use certain spaces absolutely and it comes to to to, you know conversations around class right Mm -hmm. there you go yeah and that is a lot of the conversation there you go there's an idea when you mentioned about um people like you know having like wood fires and things like this there's there's it's (laughs) it's almost as if people um, get to kind of treat the environment in ways that feel the most connected to them. If it's about kind of gathering and jovial spirit and like eating outside, like let's burn this this, like fire with no regard to the the rest of the the, um, conversation. Whereas- and just your neighbors too, your neighbor that, that, that lives there and has to smell all your, your smoke, you know? <laughs> really, really important that like, when I feel like I'm using the word important so much in this conversation, but it is, it's really important that when we are having this conversation, we're looking at all the different areas that people, uh, all the different ways, sorry, that people engage with their environment because it's all part of the story. It's not just like one kind of, um, yeah it's not just one narrative and yeah. it's really important that like everyone yeah. how they experience it is, is seen and connected exactly because I mean you know I, I said I, you, you hear me talking I, it's like I have a thing about the wood burning fires nowadays I actually don't and and people will choose that they need to do it but we have such a big problem an air pollution problem in Bristol and everybody agrees right so if everybody agrees why is it that we have so many people still burning wood fires and we know it's not like working class and poor people burning wood fires and if they are actually for heat then that's necessity right it's kind of aesthetic right now to have your nice wood burning fire in your house but quite often this is the same sect or you'll get a subset of these same people who are involved in all the climate emergency this and that and not recognizing that okay the stories here they don't match up and there might be a reason why you need to burn that fire but like you have to recognize we have to recognize and i mean it's the same thing with park we have you know we have all these stories in Brussels all these young boys in the park violent boys in the park this and that first of all I would prefer to be in a park than kind of anywhere else floating around right mm-hmm. and it's just this narrative of of of, of teenage boys and uh, causing problems disruptions in a park always a, a specific community that you kind of hear this thing being talked about but we never go further and say look there's nothing for for after you turn about 12 in this area there's nothing for young people to be involved with because all the services have been cut everywhere across the board across the country right the services the youth services have been cut so they're teenagers what do teenagers do how are we just going to keep complaining complaining about them and then at no point there's going to be nobody in the community that goes down there and say look let me try and organize something so that you guys can stay in the park explore this space but it might be a bit more organized or it might be a bit more, um, you know, like p- positive affirmation for you or, you know, teaching you something, something that is developing you as a young person. And so was that's, you know, with me, I, I, I would get, I get involved in things like that. You know, I'm always volunteering at something and especially with young people, maybe because I know I have one or, but not only because I've always like done youth work and been somewhere with children also because I'm a clown I just like ram I just like play right (laughs) I just like to play but you know I just uh, that's the thing that also strikes me about 
at least Bristol, I can't say the whole, and, and, and possibly the area that I work in, is that there's all these complaints about young people, but we ain't looking at like reasons why they might end up in the, the fact that you have two sets of boys that don't like each other or girls that don't like each other that just have to congregate in the one park, right? And they're teenagers, they're allowed to not like each other and they're allowed to be a bit rowdy, you know? But it's about the, the solutions is where I'm kind of more interested because everybody likes to put it on everyone else and no one stands and say, all right, maybe I can help, you know? Yeah, no, for, for sure. And and I think that there we, we have to make space for people to feel connected to their environment, to their community. And I think sometimes that does come through intervention, right? And you see things that are happening. You say, okay, cool, let's go and have a look at this. Yeah. Um, another question I had um, is, it's kind of around something that um, we, we touched on is in the way that different communities connect with each other or their similarities, their differences, there's always kind of something that you can kind of have a conversation about like us being able to connect through living in cities, right? And, and what that kind of means. Um, do you think there is kind of, well, what do you think the, the lessons are to be learned from each other so on a local level global level um and kind of this ancestry level what what do you think some of the those connections are and kind of how do we learn from from each other cities countries continents like what do you kind of what's your your viewpoint on that mm, um <laughs> and maybe this is where we could where the global south comes in now right because yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a lot there's a lot i mean you know, I, I wrote this down to remember to say that, like that, especially in a city like Bristol, it's a thing that you almost can't, we can't forget it, right? We there's a, a like a great group organization here called 91 Ways, based on the fact that there are 91 languages spoken in Bristol, which means that we have people from that many places, you know, so many places in the world. And so there's a way that you cannot even speak in one language. And I think I take that to be um, figurative as well, literally not sometimes when you do something, you have to have uh, a person who speaks, um, you know, Chinese or Somali or sign language or, you know, something like that. You, you kind of have to have all of that because we we're talking about different ways of communicating. And so I take that in my work and say, look, let's learn from where all these you know often these different modes of communication come from mm -hmm. and you know the global south is just always there because uh, it hurts it hurt me to come to england i realized like oh my goodness there's really so much wealth in this country that when you see it on the other side where the places that it was coming from it i i kind of have to be like like let's not forget like don't fool yourself this is how this happened and we and I'm not just making this up we actually have the, the the remnants of it or the archives or the records or if you can look by yourself you can see that we're still dealing with these issues and so I think that's a big part of it because you know um I don't think that one reparations is far-fetched I might have been like I, I probably wouldn't have said that some years ago because I think after you know, since last year, it's kind of better to say that. But there was a time when that was seen as like a crazy thing to say. Yeah. Like people would ask, are you mad? Are you one of these crazy, like, are you mad? Are you, you know, <laughs> said that 10 years ago, it wasn't a thing that was ever expected. But I, I really think like, if we get these stories straight, because what was what's often our problem as like black people and people of color, is that we don't have the records and we don't have the histories written down because of the way how those stories happened, right? And so since I have the ability and kind of the, you know, I can fixate on the records and I can just go through them, I feel like there's almost a way where then, all right, let me tell that story. Let me bring it and show other people that this is what happened and or this is what I could piece together from it. And also not that my stories of my, you know, because my story is always a retelling as well, is the only one but also to show that it can be done to retell these stories or to try to find another way to, to, to voice what happened or where we are now. And a lot for me comes from the global South. It comes from the things I've learned from these other cultures that is not necessarily English culture, yeah. you know? 
and a lot of it for me is learn is the things I've learned from from of course the Caribbean of course in you know growing up in a family that was like very Afrocentric so what I learned from always just being outside of the you know growing up in a very Christian society in Jamaica you know, my mother would tell the story about the time when I cry living in water because I didn't go to church on Sundays and everybody I knew went to church and I thought that meant like my family was not like God loving mm -hmm. right but so I've always I kind of always stood outside of 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 what was um just seen as a thing to accept in a way, right? And, and my parents all, they, they, there was a point where they said, okay, but you need to understand why we don't necessarily adhere to Christianity as it is in this con this black country of Jamaica, right? There was a time when I had to get that talk and I was like, oh, I might agree with you. Still went to church, but it's like, okay, I, I understand you and I can make my own decisions now. Yeah. Um, and so I think I, I bring that just like I said, one, because I just grew up like that, you know, always saying um, there's there's probably something else happening here. And a lot and a lot of what makes, you know, like I say in my story, my lignum vitae piece, like modern Britain is built on the back of the global south. Mm -hmm. It's built on the back of the places that were called the third world, that were called developing countries, that were called the periphery. Even before that, they were called uncivilized. Europe is built on that. Yeah. Well, exactly that, right? And there's some, there's um, something around that, that, that piece that often. Well, we know, right? In, in Britain, when Britain has a like real historical uh, way of not <laughs> speak about these things. Exactly. There and, um, and not <laughs> acknowledging there. That's and it. That is a big thing. It's a yes. big thing because it's it's very it's very insidious in the way that yes. like, it's not spoken about. And I think the fact that even let's say Americans may look at England and say, oh, it's not all that the UK is like, oh, it's actually not that bad there. Like racism isn't as bad or mm -hmm. the remnants of colonialism isn't that bad. And it actually, it, it is, it's just as bad. It's just displayed in a very different way. Um, yeah. It's very telling when that's part of, of the conversation. Um, and it's very telling when, when race is brought into conversations around kind of like the disparities of let's say people of color and um, how air pollution affects us. Mm -hmm. um, let's say how even COVID has affected people. Mm -hmm. of color. Um, and when you don't speak about the colonial racial mm -hmm. conversations and history, mm -hmm. I think that's why for some people it's very hard to hear data around black people, exactly. around um, Asian people, around just anyone that is not white British. I think it's difficult yeah. for people to hear that, that data, especially when it comes to health, especially when it comes to how we connect with our surroundings. Um, yeah. I think people find that really hard because the conversations have been have been shut down for, yeah. for reasons of power. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know what? Let me tell you what struck me when I came back to England. Like I was looking at real life articles and re like real life evidence and real life stuff from the 1500s. And I could talk to people, I could meet people and they were real life reeling off their history. They could show me the list of their families in the 1600s and the 1500s. And I'm like, what? Like, you know, six, you know when your family, who they were in 1654? 1654, the British were just jumping into Jamaica, taking it over from the Spaniards, right? So I, I don't have no clue. 1654, that was what was happening. But you got your records that far? And then when people talk about like reparations and slavery and like um, indentureship of, 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 of Asian people in the Caribbean, so we hear, um, oh, that was so long ago that was like what moved me I was like you can't tell me that was so long ago when you know what was happening in your background at that time right and I can match up the dates and show you that that date this ship was leaving Bristol to go to the Guinea coast right I can show you no now that I come here and have access to these things and actually know that they exist I'm like uh-uh like we're not going to forget it because I find that's what 
you know, and it's not, this is not just environmental movement. And you will know this better than me because you've been here much longer than me, as you just said. England acts as if it didn't happen. And that's a big problem. That's a huge problem. You're right. In America, things are a lot more in your face, mm. right? It's a big problem that we pretend like it didn't happen so that when people talk about the effects, we treat them like they're mad, like they're, you know, like, like what are you talking about? That doesn't exist here. Right. Like, no, and it's because we won't, we won't allow, we, we won't look at the history. Exactly. And I, this brings me on to um, another question. Is so, be as when you were kind of, uh, and um, sorry, through the ambassador program of, of Black and Green, have you kind of encountered being in, in certain spaces where you were having to have this converse, these conversations around something that is 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 known our, our environment. Mm -hmm. our, our, you know all of that mm -hmm. what have, have what have some of those kind of learning or yeah. conditions been and because i can imagine yeah. there's lots of parts right so there's this kind of uh, space of learning but then there's also a space of teaching because you're bringing in your knowledge of kind of yeah. what you know so how what are those kind of conversations yeah been like um in 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 this sense around kind of um colonialism or around getting yeah. people of color into these conversations what's I mean, it kind of been like yeah i mean i must say that my work is on the back of women who've been doing it before and people who've been mm -hmm. doing it before so um particularly Roz Roz martin in in bristol who actually she i was i watched she did a screening of her film last night called it's on youtube to daughters of equal women and it is one of these stories about these connections um, through place, through place. And also, um, I must also big up Mama D, who, who, who Mama D specifically works on food and, and um, colonialism and the food that you eat, that's eaten in the Caribbean today and the things that were brought back to the UK. And so there's a way where I think I wouldn't even have had the confidence to start doing this work if I didn't see like my elders, those two women and many more, you know, Auntie Carol, Carol Wright, doing this kind of work before. Um, and so you have to be very brash when you when you write the things that I've been writing lately. Mm -hmm. Because, but, but I also have to make sure it's grounded in the historical fact. I think for me, that's the best part. It's, it's everything that I've written. Um, I've, I have, I have a source for it and it's, it's your papers. It's Oliver Cromwell is the one who wrote it. You know, it's like, it's the stuff found in the British National Archives. Um, and, and so, and also writing creatively. So I'm writing fiction and actually up until the, you know, the, 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 the three pieces that will come out in this year, um, I haven't written fiction. They were all kind of a bit memoir and pers you know, personal reflections. Mm -hmm. But I've, I'm writing the creative fiction with the, I suppose it's a historical fiction, right? So there's a way where I have creative license as a storyteller, as a writer to make it interesting. But the, the points, the facts that the story is built around, are they're real. They're, I have proof and evidence of them. So, um, you know, you can criticize that it's not good writing, you, you might you might criticize that, but I think the you can't criticize what is said about about colonialism and and mm. and England's heavy hand across the rest of the world. You know, I like that England's heavy hand across the rest of the world. It's very fitting. Um, so I, I guess you just mentioned some of your writing um, that is out and coming out. It'd be really good for you to um, yeah take this time to kind of. Um, yeah, go through that. Yeah. That would be good. Um, also, yeah. just to, I just want to know anyone who's listening um, or watching via YouTube, um, please feel free to drop any questions um, into the chat. Um, and then also to anyone here with us on Zoom as well, feel free to um, yeah use the Q&A. Just started raining really hard, but oh, raining is good, right? It's <laughs> good. It's not, it's not, not sorrow. <laughs> um, so my, the one, I have a piece out now in, a, in an anthology of British nature writing and the anthology is called The Wild Isles and it's edited by Patrick Barkham. 
And I have a piece in it called An Elegy for Lignum Vitae. So Lignum Vitae is the national tree of the Bahamas and the flower from the Lignum Vitae tree is the national flower of, the Jamaica, of Jamaica. And so this is the plant that I spoke about a little bit before that it's, um, um, it was just ex exported really heavily, exploited from, from, I think Mexico goes straight down to like Guyana in South America. It was all over the, you know, not just the English Caribbean, all of Europe kind of had their hand in it, all of colonizing Europe took it away. And so this is a piece written from the point of view, actually from a white man who was on those ships and he is kind of lamenting the fact that, oh my God, look what we did to this thing. And, and Ligon Vaiti in the story is actually a man. He isn't a tree. So I've written him as a man. And so he's just really mourning the loss of his friend and saying, oh, his, his fellow men exploited him. Um, so that's all now in the Wild Isles. And it's a nice quick read. Um, and then coming up, um, I have what will be, I suppose, my my first thing that you can like. So this Wild Isles is the first thing you can buy that I'm in it. But in a few months, I'll have not a book. It's just a pamphlet with rough trade books. And it's going to be like announced soon. It, is, it isn't announced yet, but we, I think it's going to be announced in like the next week. Um, and it's going to, it's just, a, it's called Testimonies on the History um, testimonies on the history of Jamaica. And again, it's kind of refuting a story that was told. So like the first study of Jamaica was called Test uh, the history of Jamaica. And it was written by this man called Edward Long. And there's a long story behind it. But my piece is written from the point of view of three people who were there in 1654, 1655-ish, writing about it. And so one of the characters happens to be like a time shifter, a time traveler, and he's just telling us about what happened. Another one of the characters is one of the maroons of, like the first maroons of Jamaica from Spanish Jamaica. So not, not the maroons that we actually even know big up. We're talking like Juan de Bolas and Juan de Serras, like real Spanish name Jamaica. You don't even think about Jamaicans with Spanish names, but these were people who were maroons in Spanish Jamaica. We'll get one story from them. And then we get one story from who is like, um, a slave woman, I suppose, who is saying, who refutes again, says like, they name all these things in Jamaica after, after these white people and after these places in England. But let me tell you what we did. And that one, I'm like really excited again, cause it's just me. And it's one of these stories that um, I just stick, I just stick to the facts that I could find in the history books um, to, to then create three characters to refute all of it, to, to just say everything in the books is, is a lie because it was all built on like exploitation and slavery. Yeah, that's all. In, that's, that's by Rough Trade Books. And like I said, it will be announced in, I think, the next two weeks. How are you feeling about that coming out? Um, it's a little bit scary because I think it, I will, you know, I'm probably going to get um, backlash from a certain part of, of, of the community if they hear about it. Of, and I mean, of of the country if they hear about it right because it's not it's not a pretty story to tell so there's a way where i think i am a bit fearful of it um but i try to like i said i try to counter that by making sure that what i say is actually what happened and i have like you know keep my sources uh, my, my references tight uh make sure that i'm not you know make sure that whatever i said is you could like i said you can say my writing is bad and you know you, you could said that but actually for the story that I want to tell you if I've told it and it get you upset actually if you're a racist and it get you upset then it's that's what it's supposed to do in a way <laughs> you know yeah there's, um, there's something around kind of the the difficulty sometimes of um of writing with and sharing any kind of creative practice really um and holding on to your integrity right and then also sharing that with the world in a way that actually yeah these things are backed up i'm going to share it with you in this particular way but actually if you wanted to go and do research you wanted to look at this thing you will find <laughs> that actually there's there's real truth to, to what i'm mm -hmm. sharing and i think um there is a certain level of bravery that comes with that right because there's it's not just about okay well i'm telling this story because it's not just story right it's, it's real these, these things are yeah and, and it's here and, and I think there's something again because of um England and the UK 
okay is kind of conversations around um, colonialism, which really just directly link to, to how people view themselves, especially um, when you're learning about history as like a person of color, let's say, and then to, it's, it's difficult sometimes to then sit in the environment that you're in, right? Then to, to live here and to, to experience certain things and knowing your own history. So there is a bravery of sharing that story, right? When it, it's conversations that are trying to be put on mute a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, so personally, I'm really looking forward <laughs> to reading yeah. it. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you didn't have to use your like your your skills, right, and your creative practice to to share that. But I'm I'm glad that that you have, and I'm really excited to kind of um, to really get my teeth into that because the more stories that we have out there, the more um, the more conversations and history that people it the more conversation history means that pe- more people can partake in it and to know that they're allowed to as well. I think this is yeah. really beautiful um, and special really about that. Um, so yeah. we've actually- I was, gonna say that, I was gonna say that, I think there's a way where it wouldn't even matter, you know, if it wasn't for kind of the year that we've had with, uh, mm. this, uh, there's a way where I don't even think it would have gotten outside of a certain small niche group of readers, you know? Yeah. But maybe that's, that's just me, thinking like oh my goodness I'm gonna say all these things right at the point where temp- where the temperature is so hot for everybody on both sides yeah right? so but but like I said it's 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 good and I've, I've I'm putting it into the world uh, yeah. come what will on that one yeah <laughs> um we're actually coming up to the end of the talk now I can't believe it's gone so fast that's it's like crazy so this is the the last talk of the series and I'm really happy to to end it in this way and to close this series about narratives um with with speaking to Zakia because I think there's just been something about how the talks tie into each other and it's really important like the way that they close as well it's, yeah. it's always important it's like if, in any creative thing where you have to go on stage right if you're the first person going on it's really important if you're in the yeah. middle it's really important the close is really important there's all of these like you know special kind of ways to to, to tie the knot almost so thank you so much for um sharing your practice and we, yeah just being really open and allowing us to kind of connect with you the work that you're doing um and also just you know that the honesty that you brought to this conversation I really I really really appreciate that um so I just want to say thank you so much um mm-hmm. thank you to everyone that is here in the zoom call thank you for coming again another week thank you so much and um, thank you to everyone watching via youtube and also people that are going to catch up on the stream later on right like thank you so much for for, for, for coming you. back to this talk it would be it's amazing um so i just want to um close with a little bit of information about kind of where we're gonna go <laughs> what we're gonna do um and then kind of yeah just kind of bid farewell on this se- this particular series um so yeah thank you so much Zakia um I really appreciate your energy you brought today um and just a little bit of information about where we're kind of going um mm-hmm. so on the seti is like you know always going to be here and um I'm really excited about the next kind of um season that we're going to bring um me and Vicky B for those of you who don't know Nikki B is our programming lead um and works a lot around our book events um so we will be kind of collaborating um on the next season which is going to be amazing um and we are going to be talking to um a lot of people that are kind of into books but also different areas right so what does it mean if you're running like a book club and you're um tackling you know books that are around anti-racism like colonialism decolonizing like what does that mean what does it mean if you're looking at um books that are specific to young people um and you know me and nikki have worked really hard on kind of putting this together and we're super duper excited to kind of bring everyone and everything back in um so that's kind of the the next steps right with on so i'm just 
here basically to tell people to keep their eyes peeled um, for April and May and we're putting out um, our program very, very, very soon. Um, so on that note, I just want to say thank you to everyone um, and see you soon, basically. Keep in touch with us by um, signing up to our newsletter. Um, you can jump onto um, the frontroom.cc um, to just see kind of any online events that we're doing. Um, and yeah, we just kind of look forward to, to seeing, <laughs> seeing more of you um, online, but hopefully also in real life as well, because um, that's always really, really, really great. So yes, Zakia, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm just going to leave you with this wonderful holding screen. Um, so yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.